<laughs> Hello, welcome to uh, the uh, Otherworldly with Changing Times, Changing Worlds. This is Chipakan, and uh, the, and I am um, tonight. My guest is is Sarah Mastros, who is, has been a speaker at CTCW, and she's been on Otherworldly. Mm -hmm. And she's, she was the one that taught us how to make the uh, Babylonian demon trapping bowls, which I, I really loved, and did a workshop on prophetic Kapala, and she discussed ancestors, and she's done a lot of stuff. And tonight she's going to show us how to make incense, because if you use incense, wouldn't it be nice to have more control over what's in it? Uh, and uh, yes. might even cheaper. I don't know. Sarah will tell us if that is true or not. Um, anyway, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah now, and uh, I will watch the chat and tell you if anything comes up. All right, so I'm going to turn my screen sharing on. Um, I'm not hiding from you guys. I just made slides because I'm a nerd who teaches from slides. Um, so I, I'm, a, I'm Sarah, a couple things about how class is going to work. I just want to let everybody know that like, because I'm sharing the slides, I can't really see you or the chat window. So I'm going to ask if you have a question, just interrupt me. I taught high school for like, and university for decades. Like I will not lose my rhythm. If you interrupt me, just interrupt with questions. I'm, I'm half Greek and half Jewish. So I'm down for interrupting. <laughs> Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, like we said today, about DIY magic incenses. Most of the material I'm going to talk about today is in my book, The Big Book of Magical Incense, which will be out December 1st in the US, and it will be out in other countries whenever a slow boat full of books gets there, I assume. <laughs> um, you can pre-order it um, almost anywhere. I'm just going to throw this out there. As an author, I often get asked where the best place to buy my book is. My answer is one, anywhere but Amazon. They're literally the devil. Don't give them money. Um, but the best thing to do is to call your local bookstore and ask them to carry it. So I think that a lot of times people who are younger or newer to our community don't really understand like how vital those witchy bookstores are as like an infrastructure in our community where people can meet up. Like before the internet, that was our social network was those stores. So it's, I think it's really important that like as a community, we keep those stores in business. You can go in, you can meet people. It really is like the best way to find local community, which I am a huge advocate of. I think mm, I genuinely really believe that there is like no substitute for the delight of working magic with co-magicians whose like breath you are sharing, whose hands you are holding physically there in the room with you. It really is. It's powerful and amazing. And real talk, I, I really miss it. So hopefully we'll get to have some in-person festivals soon. I'll see you all. As far as I know, my next in-person appearance is at the Sacred Space Between the Worlds Conference in Baltimore in January. Okay. So unless there are any of any questions sort of about me, I'm going to move on to talking about incense. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about, let me talk a little bit actually first about how this class is laid out. So I'm going to give like sort of the first half of class, I'm going to give a pretty short lecture. I'm just going to talk a little tiny bit about incense in general, and then I'm going to recommend basically the 10 ingredients that I think you should sort of keep in your like pantry. And basically almost any kind of magical incense you can imagine, you can assemble from those 10 ingredients. I tried to keep them like super easy. Um, probably, you know, actually, if you are out in the woods and are like sort of a plant person, you shouldn't have to buy any of them, like order them. The only thing you should have to buy is like cinnamon at the grocery store. I will say that when I'm talking about like, plants in your local environment and how easy it is to grow plants that is extremely biased to where I live in western Pennsylvania and it broadly holds throughout basically like the northeastern United States and most of like most of Europe right so basically if you have a temperate woodland kind of climate what I'm going to say about plants is going to be true for you as well but if you live in for example Arizona the sort of plants that are native to you are going to be very different right i'll talk about that a little bit but i've always really lived out here so i don't have a ton of experience 
with like Western desert plants or like tropical plants. Um, so incense really simply, it's stuff that you burn because it's because of the way it smells. Most, but not all incenses are botanical. They're made out of plants, right? The burning of incense is like extremely ancient, but of course it's hard to know exactly when it started because you know, if we find say like a ball of resin at a paleolithic site, it's hard to know what they were using that resin for because the plants that we use for incense Almost all of them are also good for medicine. Many of them have very practical uses, like pine resin makes an excellent glue. It's good for waterproofing. So, you know, it's hard to reconstruct what they were doing with them. But as soon in history as we start to find like stones we can identify as altars, they are covered in soot and resin from incenses, right? So extremely ancient, and it, it sort of makes sense, right? I feel like once humans invented fire, it's not that big of a step to find out that some wood smells better than other wood when you burn it, right? Um, incense in magic, right, which is what we're gonna talk about today in magic and witchcraft, it basically serves three different functions, though of course most of the time it's, it's playing a lot of those roles in combination. Like these are not clean categories, they all kind of break, blend into each other. So the first one is setting a mood, right? And in some sense, like all use of incense is just like special cases of this. A lot of times when we talk about the way that like scent in a ritual like sets the mood or like sets the vibe is how we would have said that when I was young. Um, we talk about it, about the way scent impacts our memory, right? So I have cinnamon here, like it smells like like mom and baking and warmth and like, it's like that kind of smell, right? But there are also like some complicated cultural associations, right? Even for people who don't necessarily have a direct memory of it. So like I did not grow up going to church in any way, like I didn't grow up Christian, but like if you think about what a church smells like, even if you've never really smelled like a Catholic church, like, there's a churchy smell that you are just kind of accustomed to. That smells primarily frankincense. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But it's also important to understand that incense is like, they're drugs. They have direct impacts on your brain, right? And so we'll talk about that. But a lot of times what we talk about um, as incense setting a mood is, is not as memory-based as people make it out to be, right? So like, we sometimes think that the reason like frankincense sort of feels sacred to people is because of that memory association with like that churchy smell. But in fact, frankincense also produces an altered trance state in the brain. Like it is very lightly psychoactive. It's a light anti-anxiolytic, uh, um, anti-anxiety drug. It can work as an antidepressant, it's anti-inflammatory. We'll talk about some of that as we move through and talk about the individual um, incenses, right? So I just gave you sort of two examples of what I think of as like set the mood incense, right? The first one is a very simplified version of an incense I make that I call sunshine happiness. And it's basically frankincense, cinnamon, and orange peel. When I make it, it's got a lot of other things in it too. And broadly, you'll see that like, I don't know if any of, like if you follow me on Facebook, you'll see sometimes I sell incense. And when the incenses I sell sometimes have like 20 ingredients in them. I mean, that's because I make incense for a living. So I have more than 10 things in my incense pantry. Like, I have like a whole bookshelf full of incense ingredients, right? So, but uh, they're very easy to modify to like super easy make at home recipes. And that's what's in the book, right? The book is recipes that like, I do not expect people to stop like weird, obscure ingredients. But I mean, they're always fun. The next way that offer that incense is used a lot, it's used as a direct offering to the spirits, right? To particular spirits, right? Um, and the reasons that like so many cultures use incense as an offering, um, it's really value dense, like just a small physical amount of it is worth a lot of money or barter, like however your culture values things. Incenses tend to be very value dense. And those broadly are things that cultures understand as precious. That's also why we think of precious metals or like gemstones as precious because they're like, it, it lets you put a lot of money in a small pocket basically, right? Incenses are often imported and that makes them sort of fancy luxury goods that you sort of are like, hey, God, you couldn't have gotten this in the forest. 
this only grows on another continent. Isn't it exciting and special for you? Right? That's one of the ways we use incense. Um, you know, incense has lots of different kinds. Like, it's a, quite a broad category. So it's very easy to customize to a specific spirit. Right? The, the next two, I think that sometimes people who don't do a lot of large public ritual sometimes, like, discount the fact that, like, it's actually hard to see. Like, if you have, like, say, a priestess up at, like, basically an altar table, right, and then you've got a big crowd, it's actually pretty hard to see what is going on. But incense, first of all, it goes up. Like, it goes straight up and is quite visible and smellable from far away. Right? So like the whole room or the entire field, like if you put enough incense down, you get a big pillar of smoke that is easily seen from far away. And I, I personally think that's like one of the most important reasons that incense is cross-culturally such an important offering is because everybody can see what's going on and it just goes up to the heavens where the heavenly creatures live. So obviously it is a good offering to them. It's also dramatic, right? From a, like a theater sense, like you throw it on the fire and whoosh, like this big cloud comes up, right? Um, and then the last way we use them is as magical materia, right? As specifically the same way that you would use them in kind of any other kind of magic. Sometimes that's usually, at least the way I do it, like when I am using a materia, I am either calling specifically on the specific virtues like of that plant, or I am like using it as a magical link, a sympathetic link to that specific plant spirit with whom I already have a magical relationship, right? So I strongly encourage you to build relationships, like get to know the plants in your life, the plants that grow near your house, the plants that grow wherever you take your walks in the forest, like get to know the plants that you grow, right? The pot of basil in your windowsill, like build relationships with those plants. Basil is an amazingly powerful magical ally, for example. Um, one use for incense, I'm going to show you what I mean here is, right? As the smoke comes up, I don't know if you guys can see the smoke on the screen on video or not, but you can like watch the patterns and eddies in it as a way to scry or as a type of divination. So divination by smoke um, is often called libanomancy. Although that is actually technically specifically divination with frankincense, but I think people use the word for anything. And then the other way, right, is as a medium for spirit evocation. Like if you want the spirit to be able to take on a physical form, you have to like give it something to build that physical form out of. And smoke is good for that because it's like light, and easy to manipulate for a spirit. Like it doesn't, it, I don't know, it's easier to get a face to manifest in smoke than it is in many other things. I really regret putting all this smoke on here now. Let me get that off there. Okay, there we go. Okay, um, for spirit evocation, wormwood, which is a kind of Artemisia, we'll talk about Artemisia broadly a little bit later. Uh, wormwood is sort of like, broadly understood to be an excellent herb for spirit evocation. A mugwort, which is a slightly more common artemisia, is also really good for that, but almost any kind of smoke will work as long as it's a smoke that like gets along with that particular spirit. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about how to make loose incense, but I'm just going to run through this really quick because we're actually going to make some incense. We're going to make a home blessing and protection like just a general like home blessing incense um, after the lecture, right? So a half lecture and then we'll do an actual workshop together. But basically the steps for making loose incense, the first thing to do is decide what you are making incense for. Like be really clear in your head about like what the goal of the incense is. Next, you should gather ingredients, right? I really recommend that instead of thinking about that as like, you write a list and then buy what you have on the list. I really strongly recommend that instead you just like kind of open your pantry and see what you have, right? And so I'll talk about that a little bit about how to substitute. Um, and that's one of the reasons why that most of this class we're going to talk about like what I think should be in that pantry. And we'll talk about like sort of substitutions and categories. If you start to think about material uh, ingredients instead of like a really individual plant but as a, like a category of plants that are broadly interchangeable like that gives you the freedom just like when you're learning to cook right it's the same way like 
for a little while you can use other people's recipes, but at a certain point you just kind of like open up the fridge and stare at it until inspiration comes to you, right? Uh, the next thing you want to do, you need to make sure your ingredients are dry, right? So like if you're using fresh herbs, you have to dry them to make incense. Um, otherwise it will, it will not dry properly, right? Once it's mixed together, it's better to dry them separately because they have different like drying conditions. And if you make incense too wet and then store it, it can actually hold on the incense and then you burn that and breathe it in, <laughs> very bad for you, right? Uh, the next thing to do is grind it. If you're only making like little bits of incense, you can use a mortar and pestle because I make incense in larger quantities. I actually use um, an electric coffee grinder, which works great. So this brand I'm using is Hamilton Beach. I've had it for like easily six or seven years. And I put stuff, I mean, the stuff I'm asking it to grind is much harder than coffee, right? So like, it's really, it's quite a workhouse. They work great. The only thing I would say is like, get a separate one for incense, not the one you use to make your coffee with. And it's not really that like, none of the things that we're gonna make incense with are poisonous, like they wouldn't really hurt you. But the truth of the matter is that like, resin in particular, like once you put frankincense in a grinder, you are never gonna be able to get it 100% clean. It's really sticky. So like, just get yourself a four potions only coffee grinder, which is what I do. Right, but I recommend you label it so your roommates don't use it for their coffee. Um, personally, I don't like, some people grind it the whole way down to powder, but I actually like my incense to be a little chunky. It's partly like, I just think it looks cooler that way, but also that means that like, you don't get exactly the same scent the whole way through, right? So like, as the chunks burn at different speeds, like first it'll be more cinnamony and then it'll be more frankincense. And I like that because otherwise, like, you know, if you smell the same smell for too long, you just kind of go nose blind to it. But when it's chunky, you like get more, a little bit more variety, like enough to sort of keep you attentive to it, right? Um, that says mix, but should clearly say mix. Um, so I bind almost all my incense with honey. And we'll talk about that a little bit later um, as we talk about how to make the specific one word. How to burn it, right? There are a couple of options. Um, personally, my favorite is just over incense charcoal. It, you can tell that I already have one lit, but I'm gonna light another one for you. It looks like this when it comes out of the package. First thing I'm gonna say is if you don't burn incense very often, like this stuff goes stale. So if you're not gonna go, like it, once you open a tube, it'll be good for like maybe three or four days. But if you're not burning incense every day, like put it in a Ziploc bag and squeeze the air out because these charcoals go stale and they're really hard to get lit when they're stale. So if they are stale, they'll still light. You can put them on a spoon and just hold them directly over the burner on like a gas stove or even a candle flame, right? To get them lit if you're having trouble. I mean, see how I'm just holding this in my hands? I don't know. Sometimes you catch your, like sometimes you burn your fingers if you do that. So if you're wise, you'll probably put it on a spoon to light it. But I don't know. I burn a lot of incense, so I'm not going to burn my fingers. Um, you can use an electric burner, which have a lot of advantages. They're cleaner um, in the sense like they don't put a lot of smoke into your air and they're less wasteful in the sense like you get more out of each bit of incense because they're not burning it as hot. I actually, for me, less smoke is not an advantage. Like if I didn't want big clouds of smoke, I wouldn't be burning incense. Like that's what I want out of incense. So I rarely use an electric burner, but they are nice. If particularly if your use of incense is just to make it smell nice, you get a much more subtle scent with an electric burner and you get more, particularly from things like resins that burn at a low temperature, you get like a more subtle um, appreciation of their finer qualities than when you burn over charcoal, which is like a relatively, it's not real subtle to like stuff on fire. Um, you can just put the incense in a spoon and hold it over a candle. Um, that does work, like if you're out of incense or if you're out of charcoal. Uh, really, the only problem is, you know, the time period from when the spoon like bowl is hot enough to melt the incense, but before the handle is hot enough to burn your hand is like not that long. So it's not a good option, but it does work. Um, finally, if you want a lot of incense, especially outside, like if you're going to carry incense around an outdoor circle, at like a big ritual and you want big clouds or smoke, line a cast iron pan with tin foil 
and get the pan just super hot, right? Put some incense in and it'll smoke basically indefinitely. Like it'll smoke for a good 20 minutes as you walk around. Obviously the pot holders so you don't burn yourself. All right, I just wanna, this is just sort of a correction to something I see a lot. So a lot of people, what they're doing with incense is using it to clear space. But when I see people do that, like they are not using enough. Like it's not, when you are smoke cleansing a space, that smoke is not homeopathic. You gotta, like, you need to put a film of that plant material on the whole space. So like it, it should be so smoky that it's difficult to breathe in that room. Like if you are really, like if you actually need to clear a space, right? You've done some magic, it went really wrong and there's like some nasty thing living in your kitchen now, you need to fill that space up with smoke. Like not, it's not a little bit of smoke, right? Um, so like close the room off, put a big bowl of incense in the room, unplug your smoke detector and like shut the door and just let the whole room fill up with smoke and then let the smoke settle. So there's like a little bit of a film of it on everything. That's what smoke But I'm also going to say that broadly, I think that almost all beginners over clean, like they are constantly banishing. First of all, it's just a really rude way to interact with the spirit world. Like, hey, none of you are welcome here. Get the fuck out. That's not a right way to treat people unless they're like really like, in my opinion, you should clean when it's dirty, but you should not be prophylactically scrubbing everything because it, it just like ruins the ecosystem of the natural like spirit ecology of a natural healthy space. Uh, and the final thing is when you banish, you, you don't just leave it like a vacuum because whatever you banish will just fall back into the empty space if you're not constantly pushing it out, like instead banish and then fill the space up with whatever kind of energy or spirits you or whatever like you want in that space, right? Okay, so now we're gonna get into like what I am thinking of as sort of the nitty gritty of this class, right? Which is these 10 basic ingredients that I think you should keep on hand. So this is a list, but we're gonna go through them one by one on the slides. Um, and I'll make sure to give everybody the link to these slides so you'll have everything right some kind of resin is when the people just flat out say incense like particularly an ancient text if it just says incense it definitely means resin if it's european or near eastern it almost certainly means frankincense like if it just says incense it means frankincense um resin a lot of people think it's the sap of the tree but it's not it's a special fluid that a tree produces to help it heal wounds right so it's easy to collect in a forest just like wander around and look for a tree where like a branch has fallen off and you'll see the resin that has drawn to the surface so don't scrape all of it off the tree needs that to keep it's like th that's what's sealing over it's like a band-aid for the tree it needs that but you will also see that under the wound there are like big drips of it that's extra the tree doesn't need that you can take that the easiest way to do it is just scrape it off with a butter knife um magically the best way to think about resin is as like distilled sunshine like it's just pure sunshine in magic in like burnable form right resin doesn't have a super strong smell until you burn it usually right um different resins obviously are different but basically all of them are sort of solar or celestial right they're associated with the upper world they're sacred they're mood lifting and as i explained like i don't mean mood lifting sort of metaphorically they have direct like neuroactive results in your brain frankincense is excellent for clearing a space it's good as an all-purpose offering but you do have to be careful certain spirits particularly spirits of what I think of as like the deep underworld, the sort of like the nastier demons, they do not usually like frankincense. It's not usually a good offering for them. Myrrh is a slightly more underworldly incense. It's really good for the dead. We're gonna talk about some different incenses, some different resins, I think on the next page, right? The last thing I'm gonna say is that resin is easy to collect, right? Like if there's a lot of trees, if you wander around like a forest or a tree nursery for an hour, you're gonna find some resin. And you know, a little goes a long way. Like I buy it by the pound because I sell incense, but for like normal home use, you do not need very much of it. 
like it is easy to wildcraft a sufficient amount. One way to get a lot of nice pine incense, um, pine resin, is just go ask nicely at a Christmas tree farm if they mind if you collect some resin from their trees. And they will not mind. They will probably not mind. Like it doesn't hurt the tree any. So as long as you go when they're not busy and you're like not a jerk about it, they'll probably let you. But I mean, I don't know, maybe the person who sells your Christmas trees is a jerk. I don't know. The, the, I've never had anybody be anything but like say yes about it unless they were super busy. As I said, um, at least where I live, pine resin, usually white pine is like the most common. It's just like a super ubiquitous tree. It's everywhere. Um, I, I encourage people to collect it, to wildcraft it instead of like buy it from Amazon. But I mean, I'm not gonna lie, like, well, I don't buy it from Amazon, but I do buy it from my local food co-op, frankincense. And I do that because I need, I mean, I go through a lot of it. Um, broadly, frankincense and pine, I find relatively interchangeable. Like they're pretty similar unless you really are drawn like sort of the specific history or like cultural associations of one of them. Copal is another popular resin. It's from South America. It's kind of hard to responsibly source it. Like a lot of it is harvested by slaves or like quasi slaves in like not real good free trade ways. And it's not really always grown much like. So I mostly don't use copal unless I have like a really specific reason because it's like a hassle to get it in a way that I feel okay about. Myrrh, like I said, is sort of the most underworldy of the resins. It's particularly good for like necromancy or underworld spirits, other like the dead, any kind of underworld spirits. Dragon's blood is a bright red in um, resin. It's really pretty, but it, it's actually not, like usually when you we use dragon's blood, we're primarily using it for that brilliant red color. It doesn't, it's not that it smells bad. It just doesn't have a super strong smell compared to other resins. So usually when we use dragon's blood in an incense, we're using it along with other resins. My personal favorite resin is called Chios Mastic. It's grown only on the island of Chios, which is a Greek island in the northeastern Aegean. Some of my family is from there. Um, and uh, legend has it that like my my grandmother Catherine Katarina, like her her family only survived like the mass. There was a, a Turkish. When the Turks, one of many times that Turkey conquered Chios, um, they massacred most of the people on the island. Um, and like my family survived because they raised mastic, like they worked in the mastic, I guess, orchard, and the Sultan wanted mastic. Like he, so he needed people to produce it. So it's really close to my heart. Um, it's, it, it's pretty expensive, honestly. So like, um, I really like it, and there are recipes where I think it's better than frankincense, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend you keep it on hand because it's kind of spendy. I just have a personal relationship to it, like it's my favorite, so I'm going to tell you about it. Um, the next kind, the next sort of category of something you should keep on hand, I think, is some kind of aromatic wood, right? So usually I use cedar. Um, usually I actually use Eastern red cedar, which is technically, um, not cedar at all. It's an arborvitae. Um, but if a plant, if a tree is called cedar, it's usually pretty interchangeable for cedar magically. Like things have the same name for a reason. So even though it is not technically a cedar, um, the <laughs> cheapest, easiest way, like if you just need a tiny bit of it, um, wood pencils are almost always made from California incense cedar. So like, you know that smell when you're in elementary school at like the pencil sharpener when you could like smell the pencil dust smell? That's California incense cedar. Like that's why it's like so nice smelling when you grind it. Sandalwood is the other sort of really common aromatic wood that we use. But again, it can be a little hard to responsibly source it. Um, I generally recommend the kind that's grown in Australia. It tends to have a little bit better labor practices. Fruit woods are all nice. Apple wood, cherry wood is a particular favorite of mine. The truth is almost all wood smells good when you light it on fire. Not all of it. Uh, Tree of Heaven, for example, on Lanthus, I will tell you from experience, smells very bad when you burn it. Um, but like, I really encourage you to like whatever kind of wood you have available outside, 
like set it on fire and see what it smells like, right? Um, but I mean, at its most basic, wood blend gives kind of like a campfirey type smell. And the presence of wood in an incense can just help the incense burn a little more smoothly, right? So particularly if you want an incense, if you're making an incense for like a long ritual, it's good to have like a base of a really finely ground, like, um, like a powder, like a sawdust level. Um, of some kind of aromatic wood. Again, I usually use cedar. Um, you can buy cedar like pre-ground in like little sachets that are intended to put in your closet to like keep moths away. They're super cheap. I mean, like I saw them at Walmart the other day. Like they're quite ubiquitous. The next category I think you should have on hand is a family of herbs called artemisias, right? Um, it's a pretty big family. All artemisias are good for healing magic. They're good for trance induction. They're good for spirit work. They help open the psychic senses. They're really good for cleansing and they're protective. Artemisia, I think of as like the queen of witch herbs and the herb of the witch queen, right? I really love it. Mugwort is the artemisia I use most often, which if you live really anywhere in the Northeast, I can pretty much guarantee you that there is mugwort growing within a mile of you. Where I live in Pittsburgh, it is literally growing in basically every roadside ditch. Like I drove the Pennsylvania Turnpike relatively recently, and I would say half of that road there was mugwort growing a lot just in the ditch on the side of the road. It's a very, very common herb. If you grow it, if you're not a super experienced gardener and or you don't have a lot of space, I recommend putting it in a pot because as I mentioned, it's kind of weedy, it'll spread. Wormwood is another really good artemisia. It's a little bit more thonic, a little more underworldy. Um, and it's a little bit more aggressive. Right, it's a little bit more aggressive and a little bit more underworldy, but broadly you can kind of switch them. Tarragon, right, is another kind of artemisia, and like you can get at the grocery store. Um, it's good. It it's a little bit more like martial and aggressive, right? So wormwood is a little bit darker than many artemisia. Tarragon is a little bit sharper and pointier, um, and like draconic associated with dragons, which sometimes is excellent, but it's like mugwort is a more, I think, all-purpose artemisia, but that might just be my taste. Was there a question? Okay, so sagebrush and blue sage, by the way, are not actually sages, they're artemisia. But the next category we're going to talk about, salvias, the broad family of sages, they mm. and artemisia, oh, yes? Did someone say something? I guess not. It's fine. Okay, so salvias, right, sages um, are another big category of herb. You should keep one of them on hand, um, but really you can get away with, you can usually actually substitute a salvia for an artemisia back and forth. Like they're clearly not identical, but they're like, usually you can get away with, they're good for the same kinds of things. As you can tell from the name, they're really healing. They're excellent for healing. Um, they're particularly good for like, trauma and mental illness and physical like brain healing, right? Sages in general are, but common sage in particular is good for it, like regular garden sage, like grocery store sage. White sage, which is also called bee sage, is very popular. Um, it won't really, it won't overwinter where I live, so I don't have a lot of experience with it as a plant. And for me personally, everything that people do with white sage, I'm going to do with either mugwort or rosemary. So I actually don't use it a ton because again, it's a little bit hard to responsibly source it. And generally, I would strongly prefer to use plants like native to the ecosystem where I live and work. Um, so the salvia I use most often is actually rosemary and not common sage. Rosemary is also a salvia. Um, it's just a little bit sharper and slightly more mm, protective than garden sage is. It's really good for cleansing. Um, it has a really strong uh, European mythology about being anti-patriarchal. Like rosemary is like the woman's herb that helps you fight back against an abusive husband, for example. Um, it's also shaped like, you know, because it has, it's shaped like little needles. You can use that in sympathetic magic to like needle people with. Um, rosemary is for remembrance, as we all know, and it is particularly like in 
in a well-documented scientific way, it's good for the memory and it is also magically good for like uh, more spiritual kinds of memory, like past life memory. Rosemary is also really good for marriage magic, um, which I understand to be sort of a subcontext of its ancient day patriarchal use. Cinnamon. Um, cinnamon is great in incense. You can burn it by itself. Be careful about burning ground cinnamon, like from the grocery. So, you know, that the grind you would get from cinnamon, like at the grocery store, is a much finer grind than you'll we'll get out of like a coffee grinder or definitely than a mortar and pestle. And if you put a really fine powder on charcoal, it can spark, it can like whoosh up in a big flame in a way that can be a little dangerous and it can spit sparks. So chips, which are what I use, I'll show you in a second. Once we're done with the slides, I have like, you know, show and tell. Um, I like chips better. I generally love cinnamon and cloves, but the whole category of like cinnamon, cassia, nutmeg, cloves, allspice, spice bush, American spice bush, uh, like sort of that pumpkin pie spice family. Um, those are broadly interchangeable magically. They're not, I mean, it's like if you read the book, you will learn all the specific details of like which one's better for what. But usually if, an, if a recipe calls for one, I mean, you get away with any of them. They're good for like family home. They, like we were saying before, they sort of smell warm and happy. So we're gonna use that in our house blessing incense. They're good to like spice up love magic, right? So the kind of love magic that you might weave with other plants as sort of your primary allies, adding a little bit of cinnamon can just like keep things interesting, if you know what I mean. Uh, cinnamon is again, an imported luxury trade good and it's particularly good for wealth magic. Cinnamon is pretty common in wealth magic. Mm. Um, I particularly like cloves against the evil eye. And similarly to rosemary, cloves look like little nails and you can use that in your magic, right? Any questions about that? Cool. The next thing is flower petals. Um, flower petals generally um, we're gonna use for sort of like Venusian concerns, love, beauty, luxury. They're good for like the spring and awakening. They're good for fairies. They can very gently open up the psychic senses. They make excellent offerings. Honest to God, I don't think I have ever had a spirit turn down roses as an offering. Like everybody likes them. I mean, like, just like you would take roses on a first date for a human. I don't know, probably you wouldn't. That's a little try hard. I don't date a lot. I'm a nun, so I don't really know how that works. I'd take roses to a first date. That's probably why I'm single. Um, but you know, they're good for spirits. They're pretty like roses and frankincense. If you're not sure what offering somebody wants, rose or frankincense are good options. Um, I use rose petals a lot. Um, you got to be careful. If you use florist roses, they can be like covered in pesticide. So like I sometimes use a little bit of a florist rose. So like like a rose that I got as a gift from someone. I'm gonna use that particular rose petal for like its magical link, but I'm not necessarily gonna use a whole rose worth of petals. I'll use like one of those petals and then some cleaner petals that either I grew myself or I harvested from somewhere that like I know isn't spraying with pesticides or you can buy, you know, rose petals. Um, Indian grocery stores often have big, cheap bags of rose petals. Jasmine is the other flower that I use next most often. Compared to rose, jasmine is like a little bit more lunar and a little bit more prim and proper, if that makes sense, right? So jasmine is sexy, but it's not as like mm, overt about it as rose is. Um, next, I use a lot of wildflowers, just like whatever flower, and by wildflowers, I don't, I mean wildflowers, but I also mean like whatever's in my garden or my neighbor's garden or like just whatever flowers I have access to. Um, almost all flowers smell good. And when you burn them, some of them retain their smell well in burning and some of them don't, like just experiment. Um, and they're good if you want to introduce like a bit of color magic into your incense, right? So sometimes I add like say violets, which in truth like mm -hmm. you can't really smell them once they're burning. Um, if you want to mimic that violet smell in incense, orris root will sometimes help you do that. Um, but sometimes I add them really mostly for the color, right? Um, would, would, I mean, I, would the um, lily of the valley, which I know is digital, has a heart reaction with burning. I mean, I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't huff it. Let, look, okay, let me, <laughs> let me back up. I am not like a professional herbalist, right? I am not a biochemist. I, if you have a heart problem, you probably shouldn't. But in principle, like, you'd have to really burn quite a lot of it. And like, you'd have to put your head directly over that smoke and huff it, I think, before you'd get much of an effect. And so like, use appropriate caution. Was, when you okay. say fairies, are you talking the fae or are you talking the elemental plant spirits? Well, I meant the good neighbors. Okay. Like the kindly ones, but in actuality, both is like I could have meant both, and that would be generally true. But in this particular, when I use that word, I gener I mean like the good neighbors, who I will say I actually don't do a ton of work with. So that's more of like um, how do I say? I actually mean it more in like a metaphoric way because I rarely work directly with the good neighbors. It's just not. Like, usually all I want from them is for them to leave me alone, truthfully. Um, but there's not, like, that's just a personal preference in my particular practice. But I did, I did mean the good news. Okay, the next thing I think you should keep on hand is whole black peppercorns, right? Um, okay, first off, do not put ground pepper on charcoal. Like, you are basically fumigating yourself with pepper spray. Like, don't do that. Right, a little like one peppercorn is more than enough. But peppercorn is really strong. It's very powerful. It's very martial. Um, it will help you set and enforce boundaries. It's good for mat banishing, and it is excellent for malefica for cursing. Um, just be careful and don't use too much. Um, it's particularly good against the evil eye. You can carry three peppercorns in your left pocket as a just like sort of a go-to daily protection. And one of the reasons I put this on here is because I want to point out that like magical incense, it doesn't always smell nice, right? Like sometimes you smell like some pretty off, you burn some pretty awful smelling stuff for magic, especially if your magic is kind of nasty, like nasty magic generally smells nasty, um, which means cursing, but it also means curse breaking. Like curse breaking incense is usually pretty gross. Um, garlic and onion peels, like the papery part, those are excellent um, in like banishing incense and against curses. Um, garlic peels, cloves, and tobacco is an excellent curse breaking incense. Uh, conifer needles, right? So like pine needles and cedar needles, usually Western white cedar. Um, somebody's got making a lot of noise so you could mute yourself or whatever that was um those conifer needles i usually use either pine needles or cedar um depending what i have they're really good as sort of a tonic sort of like a they kind of wake you up they're clearing they sort of help you focus a little bit they're excellent for purification they help you build a connection with the world tree particularly the world tree of like whatever tree you're burning which is also true about wood and resin a little bit but i found conifer needles I found cedar in particular to be an excellent world tree. Um, all, all conifer needles, but cedar and juniper in particular, they help open up the psychic set, site a little. They're good for the dead. Um, yew is poisonous if you burn it in large quantities, but it is traditionally burned as an incense for necromancy and malefica. And again, like, I mean, unless you're doing it, unless you're burning a lot of incense in a quite small room, you're really, you, you can only poison yourself so much. Like it's just not enough of the substance to really be used. But I will say when I work with you incense, right, which is usually for necromancy, um, I tend to do it outside or minimally with the windows open just in case. But I've never had any bad effect from it. So I don't know, if you poison yourself, like, I guess here's where I'm gonna come down on that. Like, you guys are all grown ups. Like, I feel like I shouldn't have to tell you, like, don't, if you're gonna burn and then huff random things, you should do that outside and like, don't be stupid about it. You know what I mean? But you can't, almost nothing is so poisonous that like a tiny little bit of it will really hurt you. Unless, of course, you're super chemical sensitive, in which case you should not be burning and huffing random plants that you maybe don't even know what they are. 
The last kind of ingredient I think you should keep on hand are things that are special to you, right? So the way I was saying like kiosmastic is special to me um, and my family, right? Or like plants that I particularly grow. So I have many apple trees, right? So I use a lot of like, I scrape little bits of wood off, just a little bit, not enough to hurt the tree. Or like if a branch falls, um, or like crab apples, I actually use in incense a lot because I grow them, right? Berries and fruits in general all make excellent incenses. You got to be careful about how you prepare them because they're sticky and they don't always burn very well. Um, another thing is like a plant, if you go to like a special location, special to you or like special in a more broad sense, see if you can like gather some plant material. And you don't have to do that from living plants. So I gathered up like a good, almost a full cup of fallen olive leaves from Athena's sacred olive tree at the Acropolis. Like I just sat next to the tree for half an hour picking up tiny leaves out of the dirt. And like people looked at me a little weird, but nobody stopped me. I mean, I wasn't like, like, like they were dead leaves, right? Nobody, there was no reason anybody could object to it. And I, I use them very spare them. I give them as gifts sometimes. Um, sawdust or shavings from special locations, right? So you can actually just like scrape a little tiny bit of wood like off a piece of furniture. Like if you wanted to hex your boss, which I don't usually recommend, by the way, hexes have a tendency to trickle down. Like don't hex your boss until you've already left and gotten a new job. Like you can just take a tiny little, like, like just take an exacto knife and like scrape a tiny bit of wood off their desk. That's a really good link. Um, animal parts are very traditional in incense. Um, snake skin is used a lot. I have a pet snake, so I have like a never ending supply of snake skin. Um, hair of a dog, particularly hair of a black dog is a really common ingredient. Um, you know, all of those smell pretty nasty when you burn them. So like use just a little tiny bit. The next kind is like just flat out drugs, tobacco, marijuana, mushrooms, all of those can be used in incense and traditionally all of them have been. Um, for example, the holy temple incense, like the holy um, incense in the Bible is made with marijuana, like substantial quantities of marijuana. Um, you can put tiny little bits of paper in incense, like rip them up super tiny so they don't like make a giant fire um, and get out of control. And you can do that either with a link, right? So if you're like trying to get a job, right, you might use a tiny little like piece of paper from the job ad right? Or like if you're trying to get a mortgage, you might just get a flyer from the bank and pull off a tiny piece of paper that like has their logo on it and add that in. But you can also like make a scroll and then tear that up and add it into your incense. But for obvious reasons, like, you know, be sensible about how much paper you try and light on fire at once and like, don't burn your house down. Finally, you can use personal effects to link to a target, their hair, their nails, their signature on a paste. That's really, I mean, a lot of these like bits of paper was really just a special case of this as was but like a lot of these are actually just special cases of that. The last ingredient is honey. I use honey in almost all my instances. Um, I use it to physically bind the ingredients together. So like once they're powdered, I mix in some honey to like stick them together. Honey the way you should think about it is the magically distilled, magically by the bees, distilled incense of flowers from a huge region, right? So it's very good for land magic if you use like your own local honey, or similarly, you can use honey from a special place. So whenever I like go visit a sacred location, I try and buy some like honey from there to bring home with me because I like to use it like as a link to that place. Magically honey, as you might expect, mostly its magic relies on its sweetness and on its stickiness, right? So it's good in like love magic or happiness magic. It is generally like make people like you magic, get along with your neighbors, for example, is a kind of sweetening magic. Or it's used for its stickiness, right? It binds things together. Um, honey is also particularly good in necromancy. Bees traditionally um, can speak to the dead. Like they carry messages back and forth from the dead. Uh, personally, I really like clover honey. Um, which, you know, rolling in the clover is an old fashioned way to say really rich. And that's because like the presence of clover on land is a sign that that land is really fertile because clover nitrogen fixes. So clover is very sacred to the good neighbors. 
and broadly to many kinds of nature spirits, but it's hard to, or elemental spirits, but it's hard to, how do I say? It, it's hard to generalize, right? That's a very big category. Clover is good for beauty and happiness. I really like clover honey. Um, so again, I think sometimes people ask me like, what makes my incense so much better than other people's incenses? And it's really two things. It's one, I just use like high quality ingredients and no filler or chemicals or anything. But also I think it's the honey. I think people really like the honey. Burning honey is just like a beautiful smell. So this is the recipe for the incense we're gonna make today. I'm gonna turn the slides off in a second and like actually walk you through making it. But what I want to tell you is that, you know, incense, like lighting things on fire is not a subtle art. Like the exact proportions are very, very rough. You can like substitute for whatever you have. So for example, uh, I wrote this recipe for frankincense and then approximately two hours ago, I discovered that I am completely out of frankincense or more likely we're in the process of moving like my office from one room to another in a house. So I think actually my frankincense is just in a box somewhere. So we're actually using pine resin despite, right? We're going to make these substitutions. One of the reasons I, you picked this recipe is, as I said, we're moving in my house. So I'm making this for me, right? Um, I'm going to, like I said, go ahead and stop sharing, right? And I just want to confirm that you guys can see my hands and my desk right now because we're going to make some stuff. All right. Does anybody have any questions before we start? I was wondering if about burning sugar. Yes. You can you know, burn sugar. I don't know. I don't because I use honey. Yeah. But I would imagine you could use honey pretty much interchangeably. I mean, the reason I use honey instead of sugar, you'll see, is because I like am physically using it to glue the ingredients together. Like I want it to be sticky. Um, I have used like molasses before. Um, and that worked really well. But yeah, I mean you could certainly use sugar. I mean, we've all smelled. I assume everyone is, maybe not, people don't cook anymore. But you know, burning sugar actually smells quite pleasant for quite a while. Oh, uh, do not, if you're burning sugar, like it's like napalm and it will peel your skin off. Like I have burns from making caramel, don't burn yourself with it. Okay, so I have pre-ground my ingredients, partly because my grinder is really loud, but mostly because the truth of the matter is grinding incense is a little bit messy and I didn't want to do it right next to my laptop and like get all that frankincense dust in my laptop, right? So here we have the frankincense, right? So as you make an incense, you really want to like keep your mind focused on what you are doing, right? And so you want to really carefully think about like, what is my intention? My intention is to like, I have a new my friend moved in, that's why we're all moving. Like everybody swapped bedrooms, my office moved room to room. It's a whole like thing, we had to build a wall. Um, so the hell's it a bit of disarray, right? So like my biggest intent is to just like make everybody happy, like everybody in the home be one big happy family, like all gets along, blessing, a little bit of cleansing, but I mean, I don't, because I don't banish all the time, I have a solid ecosystem of spirits here. So like, I don't, I don't get infestations with nasty spirits because I keep a house full of good spirits and they just solve the problem. So unless, and I mean, also I'm a grown up magician who knows what I'm doing. Like I don't, you know, if I'm, when I summon nasty stuff, I don't do it in my living room. Like uh, that's outside play as my mother would have said. So we're gonna start off with frankincense. Uh, actually it's not frankincense, as I said, this is mostly pine resin and a little tiny bit of frankincense because I had like one tablespoon of frankincense left. Um, I'm making a relatively small batch compared to what I make as a professional incense, but a pretty big batch for somebody at home. I'm making a little more because when I tried to make single serving, like you couldn't really see what was going on. But you can always just take like a single grain of frankincense and put it on like a single leaf of rosemary. So frankincense, I'm or resin, this is pine resin, I'm really using for its like connection to the sun and like just a sacred solar sort of cleansing and protection in the whole house. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that in. You can see maybe that it's mostly ground to a powder, but I left some chunks, because like I said, I like it chunky. The next thing I'm using is mugwort, which I am using here particularly for its connection to this specific land, because this mugwort, like we grew it out back. Um, and I'm also using it just to sort of like, provide a space for spirits to live in the, the human spirits who live in the house the snake spirits who live in the house and all the spirits who don't have bodies who live in the house like that's 
I want everybody to get along in my house, but particularly I am using mugwort um, for its connection to like the witch queen's goddesses, Artemis and Akati, sort of that whole category of goddesses who are very near and dear to my heart. So I'm using this for like a magical link to them in particular, right? Next I have rosemary, which I'm using primarily for cleansing and protection, right? Um, and as I use it, I'm really thinking about these little needles, sort of like sewing every, like embroidering everyone together, right? That's really what I'm focusing on. If I wasn't, doing this as a lecture, I might spend a little more time like awakening each ingredient and just like really smelling it and communing with it. But I thought it would be ridiculous for you to just watch me sniff things for 10 minutes. So I'm not gonna make you watch that, right? But you know, you're gonna smell it, you can taste them. Personally, I would never make anything out of incense that I was unwilling to put in my mouth. Like those nasty chemical, like dollar store incenses. I don't know, man, if I wouldn't eat it, I don't wanna breathe it either. Right. Although I live next to a steel mill, so my air is pretty bad to start with. Right. So I'm gonna put the rosemary in. And rosemary, one of the reasons I like to use a lot of kitchen herbs in my magic is because I have this really like long and complex history with them. Right. Now, every time I cook with rosemary, I can build like every time I cook a chicken for my roommates, I can tie that back to this magic. Right. Similarly with cinnamon. So as I said. Let me put it in a clear bowl so you can see. I really like the chips better. I'm sorry, I don't really know how to show you, but you're just gonna have to believe me that the cinnamon is in chips, right? Instead of ground. Um, I get it this way at my local food co-op. Um, it's not that hard to find chips in it. But you can also get the sticks. The easiest way to get sticks into chips is put them in like a good like solid, heavy Ziploc bag, put in that inside another Ziploc bag and just whack it with a hammer until it breaks into pieces. That's the easiest way to grab it, like to chips. And again, the powder, it just foofs everywhere and it's too cinnamony. Like cinnamon is pretty strong. So I will say when you are making incense, I encourage you to start with less cinnamon than you think you need because burning cinnamon is quite a strong smell and it's perfectly pleasant, but it can overpower everything else in the incense. Next, I have cedar needles, right? And I'm actually using cedar needles and cedar wood. Um, I'm just doing that because I actually just happen to have both. So you could use either one. Um, you know, needles have more of the oils in them than the wood does, and they're not fully interchangeable, but I'm using this really for like the stability and solidity of the world tree. Like I'm imagining my house here in the middle world and like, the roots of the house go down into the underworld and like feast among the ancestors and draw strength from the womb of the earth and the leaves of the house like the branches of the house go up 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 into the heavens right just like the world tree that unites the three worlds right and that's really what i'm doing with this cedar, right so i put it in a clear container like it's not a container i would normally use to make incense why would you be able to see what i'm doing before i put the honey in I'm just going to mix it up a little. And one of the things I'm trying to do is get the powder, right? The resin powder evenly distributed, right? Because if it's in big clumps, it's harder to get it mixed together, right? So that's the first thing I'm doing. I would normally, again, I would actually mix this with my hands because it gives me another opportunity to really like energetically and sensually interact with the magic. But Again, I did not want to use my honey incense covered hands and my laptop at the same time. So I'm using a spoon, right? So I'm going to put in some honey. The easiest way to mix the honey in is in relatively small batches because if you put too much in, that's kind of a problem. So make like a little pile of honey and then kind of fold the incense onto it. The correct amount of honey is however much it takes until you don't have loose powder. Right. And so like I do this a lot, so I kind of know how much that is. But for you, you might have wanted to start with a little less. Right. And then put it in slowly if you're not quite sure how much you want. Right. That being said, incense is pretty forgiving. Right. So like if you put in too much honey, your incense will just be a little sticky. Um, you can put in some extra ground wood, which is sometimes kind of a filler. It doesn't have a super strong smell. So it's a good way to just like balance it out if you put in too much honey and it soaks it up. Um, I'm just gonna put in a little tiny bit more. Sorry, my honey's making weird gross noises. 
Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna mix it all up. And basically what you want is you don't want it to be solid, right? But you want all the powder, right, to be gone. Like you don't want powder because it'll spark and whoosh when you put it on the fire, right? And you want kind of each pinch worth to kind of stick together, right? So this right here in my hands is like a ritual amount of incense. Like this is good. This is a lot of smoke, right? This is not like I want a nice smell. This, like the size of maybe like a pea, like basically the amount of toothpaste you would use, right? And you can put it directly on the incense, right? And you'll see, I wish you could smell it. It smells really good. Um, but we have not yet created smell a vision, I guess. Um, got it all over my hands anyway. Um, okay, after you make incense, you wanna let it sit overnight. So that just the herbs and the wood will like sort of soak up the honey a little, and it'll get less sticky. Um, and then like once it's not sticky anymore, which how long that takes depends on really the humidity of your house and how much honey you put in and the exact ingredients. like herbs soak it up a lot faster than and like wood dust soaks it up super fast right um you're pretty much done i have tried many different ways to store incense but plastic ziploc bags really are the best because you can sort of roll them to squeeze all the extra air out just like any other kind of herbal material like the less air that is in the bag the longer it'll keep if you are making incense Here's another like pet peeve. I sometimes see people who have magical incenses, which have clearly been on the shelf in their like temple room or wherever for like seven years. Like natural plant materials, you can't like, like go bad. You can't store them forever. If you, if you wanna make big incense, you can put it in the freezer actually. Like wrap it in plastic so it doesn't get wet, but it'll keep like basically any other kind of plant material. It'll keep for a really long time in the freezer. My incenses, all of them, you could, if you wanted to, smoke them out of a pipe for a much stronger impact. I mean, it's not good for you. Like, smoking is not good for you, but they're not poisonous. They won't hurt you. Honestly, they're probably better for you than cigarettes. Uh, final thing, if you are ever in a pinch and you need, like, some go-to incense, a, a chai tea bag is an excellent road opening incense. Right. And in fact, many kinds of tea bags um, can be burned as incense. You just put the whole bag on an incense charcoal. Um, it's better to do it in the bag, even though you get a bit of a paper spell, because like the tea bags, right, the tea that's in a bag, it's ground really fine. And if you put it directly on the charcoal, it'll spark like it'll spit sparks all over and you'll like catch your desk on fire. Um, but loose tea you can put directly on charcoal. I have yet to encounter a kind of tea that was not delightful smelling when I burned it. In fact, my experience is anything you will eat or drink will be nice as an incense. Ancient Egyptian incense, for example, is often made with raisins. Um, yeah. uh, they, okay, another thing is if you're ever like say in a cemetery and you find yourself, you wanna make an offering, menthol cigarettes are actually excellent um, necromantic incense, like mint plus tobacco very good for the dead and I, I mean your neighborhood might be different than mine but i can find somebody who smoke like i can bum a menthol off somebody anywhere i ever am though i don't smoke right but i also actually keep a pack in my like magic adventuring box bag in the car in case i need them we have um, a question in the chat room yes uh, what would you normally mix incense in if not a glass vessel Oh, it's not that I wouldn't use a glass vessel. It's that this like clear, it's the squareness of it is not ideal for this. And also I usually, you know, I make incense for a living. I make much bigger batches of incense. So I actually use like a big mixing bowl, but I didn't have any small clear. I, I just wanted something clear so you could see what was going on on film. Um, personally, I have like a weird thing where I don't like to use metal in my magic. So I won't mix in a metal bowl, but I, I mean like, I feel like that's actually just a nonsense superstition of mine that like, it's probably fine. You could use a metal bowl. I do have like a particular pretty fancy cobalt blue bowl. That is the one, like you can see it. If you look in like, if you look in my store, you'll see photos of incense in that bowl because 
it is very hard to take an attractive photo of incense, which is mostly just like a pile of brown goop. <laughs> like it's hard to take pictures of for selling. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know. I use a bigger bowl. You can use any kind of bowl. I'm just, this square one was hard. It, it has corners. And I mean, I don't know if you can tell, like I did not do a good job mixing this because like the powder is getting stuck in the corners, but I apparently don't have any clear round bowls. I have tons of these little ones but no big ones. Um, again, so this is basically a size of incense that like you could make, but you know, for most people, this is a lot of incense that I made, right? So this would be like a good, this is a good housewarming gift, by the way, this incense. I make this for friends when they move um, and it'll store for like up to a year easily. Um, more if you like wrap it nice and tight and put it in the freezer, but it doesn't really matter what you mix it in. I like a wide thing because I want to get my hands in it. And like, I really want to push the magical energy in. I personally, when I'm making magical stuff, I'd rather sort of like consecrate and empower it as I go ingredient by ingredient, like as part of the process of making it, rather than like a lot of people will make the whole thing and then consecrate it. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's just not really the way I usually do it. So I like a bigger vessel. And again, I'm superstitious about metal. Traditionally, uh, the herbal magic uh, from the Anglo-Saxon that I'm familiar with, mm -hmm. you chant over the plants while you're harvesting, you plant, exactly. chant over the plants while you are processing them, and then you chant while you are applying them. Uh, mm -hmm. whether and while you're growing them, like you, you go and make friends with that tree. You talk to yeah. it every time you see it. Yeah, I, yeah, I absolutely agree. And that I did that a little tiny bit, but I don't know how I was saying it really felt weird to do while you guys were watching. So I was sort of talking to you and the plant, but basically the same thing I said to you guys about what I was using the plant for, I would say directly to the plant, like dear spirit of rosemary, like I awaken you once again to your life and your virtues. And I remind you that you are blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Right. Um, and there's a lot, there's some pre-made ones in my book if you want them, but I'm a big believer that it's better to just like speak directly from your heart. Um, I will say for the mugwort. Remind, remind the name of the book. It's called The Big Book of Magical Incense. It'll be out December 1st, but it's available for pre-order everywhere. And my name is pretty unique. It's pretty Googleable. So if you put my name in Google with quotes, all my books and classes and everything will come right up. Um, and I will drop in the Changing Times, Changing Worlds group. Um, I have, I'm allowed to give you like a big, like a 50 page excerpt from this book. Like that's what my publisher will let me give you. So I'll give you the whole excerpt. I, I have just popped your website into the chat for anybody. Excellent. Yes, yeah, so you can find on. everything there, but you yeah, actually, can't like this is like a book to buy in a bookstore. You can't buy it on my website. Yeah. But okay, our, this is this is when we ask for questions. Anybody out there got questions? Unmute yourself and then ask yeah, about incense or really anything else. Like, feel free to like play stump the witch. That's my favorite game. But will this recording be available? This recording will be available on the chant uh, on the Changing Times, Changing Worlds YouTube channel. Uh, if you go as Usually they go up, uh, if not uh, Thursday on Friday, they're usually up. And uh, <clears throat> then we can, and then everybody can see it for free forever. And we would like to encourage everybody to come to Changing Times, Changing Worlds, which you can either get a, I think it's $30 to get the live plus uh, look at the recordings for oh, a month, or $60 if it's for the live and uh, get access to all the recordings for a year which are very like what we have for absolute free on the youtube channel <laughs> but probably less of me grumbling because i don't know what i'm doing with the computer <laughs> so I'm, I'm just taking a look in the chat window to see if i missed anything good idea i was afraid i'd frozen again and a stand for melting. Yes, you could definitely use a stand that you would use for like sealing wax. 
Um, I mean, you could also just use a pot holder to hold the spoon with over the fire, but I really don't recommend burning incense in a spoon. Like it's, it's a little cheesy and also it's not very good for your spoon. Um, yeah. I banished when I bought the house. So I also sometimes do a first banishing when I move into a house, but I am not one of those like over and over banishings. Uh, Applewood. Mugwort tea, I also love. It's really good for I, I, senses. Rosemary for ghosts, I agree. I have found plants do volunteer in your yard if you need them. That is a yeah, uh, that is something that I have discovered. If I see a new plant and I go and look it up in my Peterson's guide, quite often what it does is exactly what somebody in the house really needs. I so, so there's a question lovely. here. Oh, sorry. No. There's a question here about cones and sticks. I actually usually don't make them personally. I just find them like messy and a hassle um, and a little wasteful because the way to do that is so, but here's how you do it. So once you have loose incense, you can actually build lots of other things out of loose incense, right? So just don't put the honey in, grind everything to a super fine powder. You wanna get a filler wood Usually what people use is called Mako wood, M-A-K-K-O, right? And it's just a super smooth burning scentless wood filler, basically for incense. Put that in and then slowly drip in water until you get like a dough. And you're just gonna have to play with the proportions because it depends what was in your original incense. So just like put a little Mako powder. I recommend that like your incense ground down powder, you like set aside like a third of it just in case you accidentally add too much mako powder, you wanna have some extra to put back in, right? So at, grind everything down fine. You just put in water until it becomes like a dough and then you can shape it into like cones. You can also make sticks that way, but it's pretty, it's actually like, it requires a sort of special level of clever handedness. You need to buy incense punk sticks. They're called punks, just the blank stick. And you can like roll that dough, the same the dough that you would make cones out of, you can roll it around the stick. But most incense sticks are actually not made from loose incense. They're actually made from oils usually. Like it's easier, if you're gonna make a stick, it's easier to take the blank punks and mix oils, right? And dip the stick in the oil. Personally, I hate incense sticks. I think they make a giant mess. I feel like they leave ash. I just hate them. I just think they're messy and wasteful. <laughs> And I don't, I just don't like them. Um, so I love loose incense because I really like the like, just sort of like very primitive sensual quality of like dropping it on. But also with loose incense, you can like drop a tiny pinch and then another tiny pinch and then another tiny pinch at various points in a spell or a ritual. And if you want, you can even vary what incense it is, right? You can have several incenses and like a pinch of this and a pinch of that. And it just feels really like, witchy like boom throw things in your cauldron boom and you get these big clouds so i vastly prefer them i do not make cones and sticks for sale because honestly they're so labor intensive that like i'd have to charge you like an absurd price because they actually take quite a while to make other things you can do with loose incense there's another question in the chat do you use dried fruits and if could you offer some examples yeah, so for example, I was saying that raisins um, are quite common in ancient Egyptian incense recipes. I use them in my kaifi. Um, I use dried apples a lot of times and like whole crab apples or whole, dr whole dried berries I use a lot, um, but a lot of kinds of dried fruit. Um, they give a little bit of a fruity smell, but honestly, mostly you just get like the sweetness out of them. So a lot of times you can like interchange fruits for each other. Personally, I usually use them only when I like specifically want to pull in that particular spirit, right? So like when I make incense for the May Queen, it has dried hawthorn berries and dried apples and usually fresh apple blossoms, because as I said, I grow apple trees, right? Um, the other reason I don't use a ton of fruit is because I always use the honey. My incense sort of already has that sweet element to it and the fruit doesn't add a ton. So I usually only use it in like historical recipes or when I specifically want to work with that particular fruit plant. 
Um, the other thing I was saying is from loose incense, you can also use loose incense as a bath, right? Like put it in a sachet because resin makes a nasty mess in your bathtub. It's sticky and hard to clean up. So like put it in a cloth bag. Or honestly, if you're making it specifically for a bath, I would just leave the resin out. The resin, like the water is not really hot enough to get a lot of the smell out of the resin anyway. And resins are kind of pricey, so there's no point in wasting them. Um, you can also make oils from them, right? So to make an oil, grind the incense up pretty fine. I usually leave the honey out if I'm making it specifically for oil, but if I already have it, the honey doesn't really hurt anything. And just put it in a carrier oil. And the easiest thing to do is put the oil in a crock pot for a couple of hours to like sort of simmer it out really slowly. Um, you know, in different applications, you can also boil it to make like a steam, right? Especially for people who don't want smoke. You can also just use it as a magical material, right? So sometimes I will just like sprinkle a whole circle of it around like a candle to do a spell. You can mix them into the wax and candles, but you got to be careful because they like pop and burn when it hits the herbs as it's burning, right? Um, Every application, it's gonna, you're gonna wanna change the proportions a little bit, right? So like a recipe that is designed for incense, when you make it for an oil, like because things distill out differently, if I was like, if I was specifically making an oil, I would not necessarily use the exact same recipe. I would maybe use the same ingredients, but in different proportions. Personally, when I make oils, I usually, start with some essential oils in a carrier oil and then add in some whole plant material. Um, but it depends on what I'm making, but you can make like, I think of loose incense as sort of like the most primitive kind of like potion basically. And then all other kinds of potions, right? Incenses and baths and teas and oils and like tinctures and everything, alcohols. Like you can sort of make them all out of incense because the way I look at it, incense is really just like a bunch of mixed up plant material. So you can use it for everything. You can also put them in, um, in like, like little spell bags. You know what I'm saying? Like mojo bags or other kinds of similar spell bags or spell jars. You can just put incense in. Do I work with essential oils in my incense? Almost never. Um, occasionally I do if, honestly, when I do it, it's because I have something in oil that I don't have in incense form. The reason I don't is because I just find it's a little hard to control the dosing. Like the oil is so strong compared to the whole plant materials that it's hard to get a good balance of them. But I do sometimes put essential oils in incense. And I do also sometimes just burn oil. Like I will sometimes just put a single drop of an essential oil on um, an incense charcoal, but I don't normally, but that's not, I just, you know, I don't know. I have, I make incense and I don't make oils usually for sale. So I have a vast repertoire of incense ingredients and I have a smaller collection of essential oils. <laughs> well, I, I think that's going to be it. Awesome. And I am so very happy to have had you here. Well, thank you. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Wonderful. Uh, and oh, gee, I can't remember off the top of my head. What are you teaching at the conference? Do oh, you remember? Ha -ha, you'd think that I would. I think I am teaching two things. One on Hecation, which are like protective doorway amulets with Hecate, the witch queen goddess, a witch queen goddess Hecate. Um, and maybe the Orphic Hymns. Ah, uh, I think I'm teaching uh, on the Orphic Hymns also. Let's, Sorry, let's I, honest, I I got this I got this show because the uh, planning committee wanted uh, three three of the classes, and we were trying to keep it down to two per speaker. Yeah. I mean, and I, I genuinely oh, love to teach. Like I said, I used to teach high school, so like. I teach a lot, right? I teach at basically any conference that will have me. Um, but I also teach a lot of online classes. So if anybody's interested, witchlessons.com, you can see a list of my classes. I'm just going to say a special thing about that. Um, the Babylonian Demon Bowl that was mentioned at the beginning, you can, like, I have a video of that you can buy for like 
I, don't, I think $18, some cheap amount of money. Um, and cool. all my classes are available on scholarship. Um, just email me for details if you want a scholarship to a class. Right now, I am just wrapping up an intro class. So a new intro class will start um, January 1st. Um, and then I'm also teaching a class on the Solomonic Pentacles, which we are only a little bit into. So you could still join that one if you wanted to. Okay, any last things before I... Okay, then I'm going to uh, turn off the recording. Awesome. And start...